Hi folks, welcome back to another episode of Teardown Tuesday. Today we're going to be talking about infinite switches. And infinite switches are very common in commercial cooking equipment. They're used to control heat in all kinds of different applications, but they're very commonly misunderstood. There's a lot of people that think of these as a thermostat, and that's not really how they work. So today we'll go over what's actually going on inside and how they work. So the first thing to notice here is on the back, we've got a couple different labels. We've got three terminals up here, P, L1, and L2, and we've got H1 and H2. And as far as how these work, when the switch is turned on, L1 connects to H1, and L2 connects to H2. But when the switch is off, there's no continuity between any of the terminals. P is for a pilot light, and the pilot light just shows the user that the switch is turned on. It does not indicate heat, so if you check this terminal when the switch is installed, it'll have voltage any time the switch is turned on to keep that light indicated. As far as the data plate, we've got a couple important things here. The, the first one is the voltage, and the voltage on these is really critical. If you use the incorrect voltage switch in any application, the switch won't work correctly. And, and I'll explain more of that as we get further inside. But it's always important that you have the correct voltage switch for the application, particularly with 208 and 240 volt switches, because they will be different. Over here, we have a amp rating. So this particular switch is rated 120 volt, 15 amps. Now this switch generates heat while it's being used, so you always want to make sure you have the correct voltage, but also the correct amp rating. If you have an amp rating that is uh, too low for the application, the switch will overheat and fail. The other thing to notice here is we have a, a little tiny label back here that says top. And that tells us that the switch should be installed this way, with this slot facing up at the top. And if we look in that slot and turn this on, you can see that the mechanism moves down inside. And the, the switch plate that's moving there has a small heater on it. So it's very important that that slot faces up so that heat can escape. It's also important that this never be covered. Sometimes people have a tendency to wrap tape around the switch. You never want to do that. You always want to leave that open so that heat can vent. Underneath on the bottom, you can see there's a very small adjustment screw for a, a calibration. That's not something we ever really mess with in the field. So when we look at an infinite switch, we see on the face, we don't have temperatures. We only have numbers. We have high, low, and numbers. And the reason for that is, the infinite switch doesn't actually know what the temperature is of what it's controlling. The infinite switch only acts like a timer. It cycles heating elements on and off with no regard for what the actual temperature is. So on its highest setting, it's going to keep the elements energized for a longer period before it stops for a shorter break. So lowest heat setting, we have a long break with a short heat period. Highest heat setting, we have a long heat period with a short break. And in between, all it does is vary how long the break is and how long the heat period is. So it acts like a timer. So let's go ahead and open it up. When we open it up, you see there's a couple different pieces that come off here. We've got some insulation, we've got a small plastic shield, and we've got this stem that our knob was attached to. Now, there's quite a few different variations of this stem out there, but they can be clocked or moved with this cover off so that the off position of the knob is in the correct position related to how this is mounted in the equipment. 
and that makes sure that all the knobs on, on a user's piece of equipment are in the same orientation. As we take a look inside here, you can see that the part that actually moves is like a cam or an eccentric. As it turns, it puts pressure on this arm, and this arm in turn moves this lever. Now, as this pulls further and further down, as we put more tension on it or add more heat to the knob setting, we're adding tension to this lever assembly. And this lever assembly, you can see, has a heat wire, very, very small heat wire, wrapped around it. Now that heat wire is acting on the metal inside, which is a bimetal. It's two pieces of metal bonded together that expand at different rates. So as we heat it up, it creates spring force against the tension that we're putting on from our eccentric here. So as we add to our heat setting, and we put tension on this lever plate, it's going to take more force from the bimetal to lift and open our terminals. Now you can see this mechanism really only applies to this set of terminals. This gold terminal on the back here is our L2, and down along the, the bottom are our circuit path goes down through the back to H2. And the spring that just fell out there sits down inside this little center piece where the stem goes. Over on this side of the switch, the L1 on the pilot terminal, you can see that the, the circuit path is complete all the time. Whenever this is turned on, this piece is pushed over to close this set of contacts back in the corner here. And they stay closed all the time. They never open and close. So back over on this end, everything is related to this heat circuit on the bimetal. And what happens is, when our circuit is closed, not only are we sending voltage through this L2 and H2 side of the circuit, we're also putting heat onto our bimetal. And our bimetal heats as long as the circuit is closed until it becomes warm enough to overcome the spring tension that we've set with our knob. When it overcomes that spring tension, it snaps open, breaks the circuit, and then it has to cool down. That's why it's so important to leave this slot opened up. Once it cools down, it comes closed again, and our cycle begins over again. It begins heating until it reaches a temperature where it can overcome the spring force that's put on it, and it opens back up. So it's acting as a timer. It's entirely built around heating up and cooling down. And as a result, this is not a thermostat. It does not know the temperature that it's controlling. It's really just acting as a timer. Now if we look deep down here inside, you can see there's a very small whisker of a wire that runs down through the back of the case, and then it runs along this black channel back over to H1. And that's how we're completing our circuit. So we've got one side of our heating circuit attached here on H2, and the other side runs through this black channel over to H1. So when this calls for heat, we also heat our bimetal. When we talk about how these fail, there are a few ways they can fail. The first one is the, the electrical contacts here burning up. Every time this opens and closes, there will be a very small electrical arc, and these contacts will eventually pit, and then they won't pass current when they come close. They have too much resistance. That resistance can also build heat and cause this outer casing to get brittle and crack or break down, melt. The other really common one is for a connection to loosen on the back and for a terminal to melt or burn up. And if that happens, 
we have to replace the switch as well. But you also want to make sure you replace the connector on the wire end that's pushing on. Once those connectors overheat, they lose their spring tension, their spring force, and they'll overheat and burn up again. So there's only going to be so many cycles you'll get out of an infinite switch before it will eventually fail. It'll burn up these terminals. That's why it's really important that you match the load, the amp rating, to the device that your infinite switch is being installed in. So ultimately, there's really not much inside these. There's a couple of basic principles at work, and those basic principles result in a, a very simple and effective way to control temperature without a lot of complication. So we've got some levers, we've got some springs, we've got a bimetal, which we see in several different applications, and a heater system. And our electrical contacts there end up carrying the load. It's so ultimately pretty straightforward and pretty simple. All right, thanks for watching. Hi folks, my name is Jack Kell and I'm a senior technical trainer for SmartCare. The video you've just watched is part of a larger series of technical training videos we make available to our technicians at SmartCare. If you found this interesting and you'd like to see more, please subscribe. I'll be releasing a new component teardown video every Tuesday in 2022. If you're already a smart care technician and you have a part that you'd like to see me tear down, please reach out to me internally for shipping instructions. If you're not a smart care technician, but you or someone you know would like to learn more about a career as a service technician specializing in commercial restaurant equipment, please check out our open positions at www dot smartcaresolutions dot com forward slash careers. Thanks for watching.